Hi there, welcome back to chemistry. My name is Jeremy Krug. In this video, we're continuing our discussion of solution chemistry. As you can see from the last video here, we were calculating molarity and learning how to work with molarity and do some conversions with that. If you're new to my channel, welcome. Take a look around, I hope you like what you see. If you do, please consider slamming that thumbs up button and subscribing, that way you won't miss a thing. This is the place for all things honors chemistry and AP chemistry. I hope you like what you see. Now in this video, we're talking about the concept of solubility. The goal is that by the end of this video, you'll be able to take pretty much any ionic compound that they could throw at you in a regular first year chemistry textbook and decide if that ionic compound is going to dissolve in water, be soluble, or not dissolve in water, be insoluble. Now, like we said in the last video, water is the universal solvent. What that means is that if you have enough water and you have enough time, water will dissolve all kinds of things. However, the fact is some substances do dissolve better in water than others. And we're going to take a look at some of the solubility rules that we can learn to help us decide if a substance is going to dissolve in water or not. Now, the neat thing about ionic compounds is that when they dissolve in water, they conduct electricity. And now, because of this, ionic compounds are called strong electrolytes. And the reason that this happens is that when these ionic compounds dissolve, those ionic compounds actually break apart into their ions. And so, for example, sodium chloride, salt, when it's dissolved in water, is no longer really just plain old sodium chloride solid. It's actually a mixture of sodium ions and chloride ions swimming around in solution. And the presence of those charged particles swimming around in the solution allows that solution to conduct electricity. And so that's why we say these ionic compounds are strong electrolytes, because they conduct electricity very strongly. Now we're going to take a look at some rules, some solubility rules for ionic compounds. Now the first rule is that all nitrates are soluble. So what that means is that if you ever see a chemical compound that ends with NO3, that ionic compound that ends with nitrate is going to be soluble. It's going to uh, dissolve in water. So that's a nice rule. Uh, that covers a lot of compounds that we actually use in chemistry, in, in high school chemistry at least. Now the second rule is that all compounds that start with alkali metal ions, so that would include lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium, as well as the ammonium ion, that's NH4, with a positive one charge, will always be soluble in water. So that means that if you ever see a chemical compound that starts with you know, Na or NH4, or CS, or something like that, it's going to dissolve in water. So we have two very good rules here starting out. Here's another one. All acetates are soluble. Now this is a rule that is not quite as common because acetates are not quite as common in the chemistry lab as nitrates or compounds that start with alkali metal ions, but this is also a very good rule to help us determine if some of these things are soluble. Anything that ends with C2H3O2 is going to dissolve in water. So here we have some nice rules that tell us some things that are soluble. And what I like about these three rules is that there are no exceptions to these rules. So if you know these, that's a really good start on understanding uh, the solubility rules. Now, these next few rules that I have for you do have some exceptions. This next rule says that chlorides bromides and iodides are soluble. So generally speaking, if you see a chemical compound that ends with a Cl, a Br, or an I, it is going to dissolve in water. However, there are some exceptions. Notice that there are three, silver, lead, and mercury. So if you see chlorides, bromides, iodides, they'll dissolve in water. But if you see a lead chloride, lead 2 chloride, or silver iodide, or mercury 1 bromide. See, these are not going to dissolve in water, silver, lead, and mercury. You just have to know that. Uh, but generally speaking, chlorides, bromides, and iodides do indeed dissolve in water. Here's another rule. Sulfates 
generally speaking, are soluble. So if you see a chemical compound that ends with SO4, it's probably going to dissolve in water. But there are some exceptions to that rule. Now, there are several exceptions. Notice there are actually six exceptions to that rule. Silver, lead, and mercury, just like we had before. But we also have calcium, strontium, and barium as well. So those substances, those six sulfates are insoluble sulfates. So silver, lead, and mercury. And to remember these other three, calcium, strontium, and barium, notice that they're bunched right next to each other on the periodic table. They're basically neighbors in group two. So those are the six insoluble sulfates. All your other sulfates will dissolve in water. Now, for these next few rules, we have some substances that, generally speaking, do not dissolve in water. For example, all chromates, that would be compounds that end with the CrO4, two negative anion, are going to be insoluble. So those chromates generally do not dissolve in water. Unless, of course, you have an alkali metal on the front of it or the ammonium ion. Uh, that's a rule that kind of wins out over, over the others. And so, yeah, sodium chromate is soluble. You know, lithium chromate is. But your other chromates from just you know, random other cations, those will not be soluble. The same rule basically applies to phosphates. If you see a chemical compound that ends with PO4, phosphate, it's not going to dissolve in water either. Unless, of course, it's an alkali metal on the front of it or the ammonium ion. We can say the same thing for carbonates. We have three rules here that are pretty much identical to each other. Carbonates, compounds that end with CO3, do not dissolve in water, except, of course, alkali metals or ammonium. Now, one last solubility rule is hydroxides. All hydroxides tend to be insoluble. That would be those compounds that end with OH, except for alkali metal hydroxides. So if you see a group 1 uh, ion paired with a hydroxide, those are going to be soluble. Most of your other hydroxides are not going to dissolve in water. I do have a note here. Group 2 hydroxides are slightly soluble. So things like calcium hydroxide, barium hydroxide, uh, strontium hydroxide, those are going to dissolve just a little bit, but not really enough to be able to say that they're truly soluble in water. So now that we've looked at these solubility rules, let's see if we can apply them. Let's see if we can decide which of these compounds are soluble in water, that means they're going to dissolve, and which ones are insoluble, that is, they're not going to dissolve in water. So here's the first example, sodium perbromate. Now, can you decide soluble or insoluble? Well, hopefully you can see that there's a sodium ion on the front of this. And anytime we see an alkali metal ion, like sodium, on the front of a compound, that means it's going to be soluble. So if you said soluble, good job. Here's the next one, barium phosphate. Well, we said that phosphates generally are insoluble, aren't they? And barium is not an alkali metal, so this is absolutely an insoluble compound. How about iron 3 chromate? Well, hopefully you remember that chromates are generally insoluble, aren't they? Except for alkali metal chromates or ammonium, and this is not one of those. How about gold 3 chloride? Well, do you remember that chlorides are generally speaking soluble, aren't they? Except for silver, lead, and mercury. And this is not one of those three exceptions. So this is a soluble compound. How about barium nitrate? Do you remember that very first rule that said that all nitrates are soluble? Yeah, so barium nitrate is absolutely a very soluble compound. How about mercury one sulfate? We said that sulfates are generally soluble, but mercury was an exception, wasn't it? That's one of the six exceptions. So this compound is actually insoluble, isn't it? How about this compound, aluminum bromide? Do you remember that bromides are, generally speaking, soluble, as are iodides and chlorides? 
The only three exceptions to that are silver, lead, and mercury. This is not one of those exceptions, so we can say that this compound is absolutely soluble in water. How about this compound, copper 2-hydroxide? Well, the very last rule that we learned was that hydroxides, generally speaking, are insoluble. Unless, of course, we have a group 1 hydroxide, and this is not one of those. How about iron 3 carbonate? Do you remember the rule for carbonates? Well, we said that carbonates, generally speaking, are insoluble, aren't they? Unless, of course, there's an ammonium ion on the front of it or an alkali metal, and there's not in this case. So this is absolutely insoluble. So understanding these solubility rules is very helpful as we talk about solutions in chemistry. And the reason this is important is that soluble ionic compounds exist as separate ions in water solution. Those ions are going to break apart. They're going to dissociate from each other, and you'll have separate ions swimming around in the solution. On the other hand, if it's an insoluble compound, it's not going to dissolve at all. It's just going to sink down to the bottom of the beaker and exist as a complete compound when it's in that beaker, in that, in that uh, mixture. So for example, if we have NaNO3, sodium nitrate, that's a soluble compound, isn't it? So when you dissolve that in water, what you're really going to have is a mixture of sodium ions, aqueous, and nitrate ions, aqueous. Those ions swimming around in solution. Likewise, copper 2 sulfate, that is a soluble compound. Sulfates are generally soluble, aren't they? So that means that that compound is going to break apart into its ions. It's going to dissociate. And what we're really going to have is a mixture of copper 2 ions, aqueous, and sulfate ions, aqueous. So it's going to break apart, dissociate, and those two solutions will actually conduct electricity. On the other hand, if we have silver chloride, well, we know that silver chloride is not soluble, is it? It's one of those three exceptions. And so if you try to take silver chloride and dissolve it into water, it's not going to work, is it? It's just going to sink down to the bottom, and it's going to sit there. It's actually going to be AgCl in the solid state. So I hope this discussion has helped you to understand, first of all, how to predict which ionic compounds are going to dissolve in water and which ones won't, and also what this actually means, the importance of the fact that uh, soluble ionic compounds dissociate and conduct electricity, while insoluble ionic compounds just sink down to the bottom and remain as solids. Hey, thanks for watching. In the next video, we're going to find some more applications of solution chemistry. Hope to see you in the next video where we can learn some more chemistry together.